that would be file number four as we continue with this if you go into the cd or the web the dvd or the website i have an animated sanctuary it was made as part of the the website and when you touch with your mouse with the computer mouse it glows so you can check every single piece of the sanctuary and study every piece of furniture and curtains and even the stone on the breastplate of the high priest. You can learn a lot of what this meaning of the sanctuary is. You can use it in class to teach your student and basically learn about the sanctuary. And the way I've proceeded with it is I have found Old Testament quote, New Testament quote that shows every part of the sanctuary as relating to Christ. Christ is the Lamb. Christ is the water of life. Christ is the consuming fire. Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So we're going to proceed now to this and I'm going to show you step by step in the sanctuary using the quote of Patriarch and Prophet, page 357. So, first I would like to show you the plan of salvation and you may, you're encouraged to read it from the Word of God, as I said from Exodus 25. Right now I will strictly speak about the sanctuary, but hopefully you will see that this is biblical. So, the plan of salvation is based on the court, on the holy and on the most holy. The court points to Christ when he came to this earth. Christ, when he came to this earth, came voluntarily to offer himself as the divine sacrifice of God. So Christ did not come because he was forced into it. Nobody forced Christ to come to the earth. He voluntarily submitted himself before his incarnation, and it's a mystery, to the Holy Spirit to do his will. And you read that in the book of Hebrew where it says, I came to do thy will, O my God. And it says, thy law is within my heart. And he was able to stand for God's character, his heavenly father's character, perfectly all the years that he was on this earth. And the purpose of this study is to show you how Jesus did it. And we can do it. Don't worry, we can do it. Am I telling you I am doing it? I'm in learning period right now, but we can do it. Jesus says we can be perfect as his heavenly father is perfect. And perfection of character does not mean maturity only. It means perfection. It means we stop sinning. We stop transgressing our heavenly father's character. The plan of salvation as shown in the sanctuary is like this. The court was the only area of the sanctuary, which is the tabernacle. This is the same picture as this. This is the only area where the people of Israel, the repentant sinner, could come in. They were never able to enter into the holy, neither the most holy. The holy and the most holy were strictly for the priest and the most holy strictly for the high priest. So the holy place, only the priest at the table of showbread was allowed to come in and the high priest at the altar of incense at the, uh, the candlestick and the showbread, the, he was allowed there. But the most holy was strictly for the, high, the great high priest. All right, so Jesus here, of course, is represented in every piece of furniture and every part of the sanctuary. There was a curtain around that sanctuary, which was about, around the court, which was about 150 feet long. And this curtain was approximately eight foot high. So interestingly enough, it was way too high to peek over, and you were not allowed to enter underneath either. There was only one door, and that door always pointed towards the west. The E then pointed toward the east, as they do to this day, but God's people always established the sanctuary towards the west. The curtains were made out of linen, white linen, and all these instructions, you may not always see them in the Bible, but I have read, as I said, the book of Askell and Andreasen and Leslie Arding, and they are treasures to read. They are beautiful instruction on the sanctuary to learn these things. So if there is things that you don't really know where that comes from, well, these books are a must. You can obtain them at good ABC stores. So 
you have here a beautiful curtain that was made out of linen, but something interesting about the linen, it was not tied like the linen we buy today in clothing. It was a type of a woven linen that you could see through. And as the children of Israel walked beside the court, it was like a curtain in, in a, a cloud in the wind. And the curtains were waving in the wind. They were in the desert. And at all times, they could see what was happening in the court. Isn't that fascinating? And linen is a very hard weave to weave, apparently. But this particular weave, as you know, the Heavenly Father instructed Moses to be able to weave it. And so that linen or flax was basically a see-through curtains. And at all times, it looked like a cloud and they could see through what was going on in the court. And so the man, the repentant sinner, would come to the court and he could see at all times the tabernacle. And he could see as well above the curtains that was not up to the top of the tabernacle that there was some light. The Shekinah glory, which was standing on the tabernacle, was always shining when the presence of God was there, if the children of Israel were faithful. At times, it would retire. It would not be there. So at all times, the sinner that would come with his little lamb to the court could see the presence of God in the presence of his light. And he would come to the door with the little lamb, one year old, that he had chosen, and many people believe that each time the sinner would sin, the Ibu would bring a, an offering. Well, from what the, the understanding of it is, once a year they had to bring a lamb that they chose from their flock, which had no blemish, and once a year they were to present it to the court. There was a scribe at the court door that would receive their name of their family and would register them in the book of Israel. So if at some point they did not come, their name was removed from the book of Israel. So that reminds you that if your name is not in the book of life, you will not be part of God's family. So then the Hebrew man would bring his family together before he brought the lamb to the temple, to the court. And this was true as well during the time of Christ at the temple. He would bring the lamb to the door after the family had bowed before the lamb at the home and confessed their sin personally on the lamb. It was not necessarily an open confession like he would do to a priest, but he would do it to the lamb, which was representative of Christ. Then he would come to the door of the sanctuary, the court, and the priest would receive him there and invite him to kneel on the north side of the sanctuary. And there again, he would kneel down beside that little lamb. And don't forget, that little lamb has been his pet and his family's pet for one year. So he was very attached to that lamb. And we say lamb, but one year old, I'm sure it was not that little. And if you have ever seen little lamb, they're so sweet. They have little eyes like very like almond eyes and they look always so sad and they're very precious animals and then the man the hebrew man would bring him to the temple and force him he was attached with a rope and force him to go on his uh lying down on the ground on the north side we're told in leviticus 1 and the priest then would give the knife to the sinner who would open the throat of that little lamb and we're told that while that little lamb was dying, the sinner was to hold his head and see him die. And it was very sad. And it was to remind the sinner that someday the lamb of God would be killed for him. So it was a reminder every time that the man sinned and had to present every year his little lamb, that this one day would be the life of Christ that would pay the price for his sin. So basically what the man was doing was transferring his sin and the sin of his family on that lamb, and then he would offer that little lamb himself, not the priest. The priest was representative of Christ, but the men had to open up the throat. And while the blood was being shed, the priest would receive it with a bowl and put it into the bowl, and he would do two things with that blood. Either he would go into the court, into the holy place, and pour it, put it on the horn of the altar of incense and sprinkle it on the curtain, or he would put it 
put some blood on the horn of the altar of burnt offering and pour the rest at the base of the altar. So there is two ways that the blood was atoning for the sinner. And it depended which sinner it was. You can read that in Leviticus 1, 2, and 3. If it was a leader, it was done differently. There is a whole kind of ordinance that needed to be done, and they had to be done very precisely. And Moses made sure that Aaron and his son were doing all that, and the priests as well. So these were the Levites. So basically, when the sinner had offered the animal and shed the blood, then he was told how to prepare that animal and cutting it in pieces, part by part, different part. From what I understand, I did a study on this and I don't have time right now to present it, but when you read it carefully with all the parts that Leviticus explains, Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4, it was basically divided by system. I thought it was very fascinating. It's divided by system and you have the circulatory system and you have the uh, respiratory system. The way they were cutting it, it was definitely in the digestive system and they had to wash certain parts that were unclean and then lay them on the altar of burnt offering in a certain order. Now, some people rebel when I teach that and they say, why all these complicated things? Why is so complicated? The blood and the poor animal? Hey. Sin is very complicated in God's kingdom. Sin has complicated God's government. Don't think like that. We have created the problem for the Lord, not the Lord. And when people tell me that, this is exactly what I say to them. Don't put the blame on God. This is what sin has done. Sin has brought a lot of trouble on this earth. And this is what the Lord was trying to show us here. Step by step, how he's intending to remove those sin from us, if we're repentant, don't forget, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner, not the sinner that still goes on and on and on with his sin. These are only for repentant sinner. Only the repentant sinner could enter into the court. Those who didn't want to repent, they never even showed up. The history of Israel doesn't tell us that, but it, it's bound to believe to be believed that there were people who did not believe in this. Can you get a whole group of people together and expect they will all believe that? No. This is what the teaching of the sanctuary is all about. Sin has caused a lot of trouble in God's government. And now, through the sanctuary, he's wanting to show us his plan. This is his mind. This is the way he thinks. So, be patient, just wait and see how he's planning it. So once the sinner had done what he was told, how to prepare the animal, then he could return home knowing that his sin had been transferred. He was released now from the condemnation of the law. And that law is the character of the Heavenly Father. And he knew that that law was in the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the law, the presence of the character of God was in the Ark of the Covenant behind the curtain of the Most Holy. Although he never entered there, he knew that the law was there, God's character. Now the man would return home knowing that he has been forgiven, justified. So basically, he was forgiven and he was justified. And justification is an interesting word. It's just as if, you see the first words here, just as if he had never sinned. That's what justification means. It's just as if we have never sinned. Christ takes the sin upon himself and decides to give us grace. Forgiveness also is very important. I have studied syntax in French and I find it very fascinating how God hides in languages secret. Just as if we have never sinned, for God so loved the world. Look at forgiveness, forgive, forgive, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So in the word forgiveness, you have a secret of John 3.16. God gave his son so that we could be just as if we have never sinned. Isn't that beautiful? So now, over the... He is, of course, the, same, the, the sacrifices continue to increase and increase and increase because people were not stopping to sin. And when we come, this is one of the temples that was created. 
during the wilderness time, or made during the wilderness time, the sanctuary in the wilderness, it's called. But we also have Solomon Temple, Zerubbabel Temple, and Herod Temple. There is actually mention of four. Some people believe five in Ezekiel, which has never been built. But four temples that existed on the earth from the time of this sanctuary. And this temple were representative of the same plan of salvation. But something fascinating and sad is by the time you get to the Temple of Solomon and you read in the book of Kings and Chronicle the size of the altar of burnt offering, it was much bigger than this little altar that they carried with them in the wilderness. I don't believe it's because Solomon wanted to show off. I believe it's because there were so much more sacrifices, so much more people, but so much more sin. And it increased as they went along. Ezekiel even tells us that the priest, after a while, just like in the time of Christ, did not even discourage the people from sinning because they started a real market with those animal sacrifices. And they were making a lot of money at the time of Christ with those sacrifices. So it became a money-making market. And it's very sad because it was never meant to be. The sinner knew that the blood that he was shedding from the lamb or from the dove or from the goat was not releasing him from sin. It was a symbolism of the plan of salvation that Christ had instituted from the foundation of the world. And he knew that by faith, as he did what God told him, that he could be released from sin. So now, as we have looked into the court, and there is much more details, but we know there is an altar of burnt offering and a laver. The laver was not used by the people. It was used basically by the priest and the high priest to wash their feet and in. And the, la the laver is very fascinating when you study it, especially at the time of the sanctuary of, of Solomon. It was actually set on Gion, which is the only source of water in Jerusalem. And there is actually proof that the old temple was built where Gion is, which is not where the mosque, the Muslim mosque is. And people are fighting for the site, but there is an archeologist who just passed away in 2002, I believe. And he believed that Gion, check it out in your Bible, that's where all of the king of Israel in the time of Solomon and the different king, they were actually anointed at Gion. And that's, it was a source of water which was feeding the labor at the time of the first temple in Jerusalem. So it's very fascinating. So the water there was a water of life representing Christ. The fire was representing Christ, the living fire that consumes our sin. And of course you have the goat, which will be used for the Day of Atonement. And then you have the bullock, which was also offered for sacrifice.